TJ, fantastic to have you here. Thank uh, you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you. And welcome to our podcast, CRO podcast. Um, for our audience, we are talking to TJ Williams, friend and acquaintance of mine for several years. TJ has been revenue leaders for over 20 years in different roles in different companies. And he is founder of Hamra Growth Advisory. I hope I correct. Uh, no, you did. Exactly the name. You got it right. Yeah. And the focus of the company is to help organization create great get go to market plan and create great revenue outcome. Thank you for being here and thank you take, for taking the time. What we are talking about here is and this podcast is to help wannabe CROs and existing CROs on how they attack the everyday challenges and how they become successful with it. As the onset, let's talk about the CRO community. Today in the world, we have 15,000 CROs roughly, and there are probably another 150 wannabe CROs who are currently sales leaders or revenue leaders of different kind in different roles. The way the revolution is, the way market is, more and more revenue or leaders are being needed in every walk of life. These revenue leaders are expected to not just be a sales leader, but a demand leader, a sales leader, and a customer success leader, and be responsible for all facets of revenue. This is hard. The day one of the job feels like three days, three jobs all at the same time. You have lived it many, many times, TJ. And I'm hoping through this podcast, we are able to bring out challenges and advices of how to be successful in a difficult sure. business. With that, love to get an introduction from you and then step into this conversation. Um, yeah, sure. So like, as you said, like I, you know, I, I, I had, uh, had a blessed career, got to work for a lot of great companies and over that career, I got smaller and smaller. Uh, at least from a starting point, you know, that I started with and, you know, smaller was fun. And I think that's probably what led me to, to even what I'm doing today, which is, um, you know, as you get a little more advanced in your career, sometimes you don't want to manage quite as many people <laughs> as you did in your past. And so uh, I get the luxury now of helping a lot of different companies in their grow to market, you know, strategy. And um, I'm kind of, you know, building a boutique firm. And so I get to work with a lot of different companies that have different uh, products and also different challenges. And so it allows me to see things done in lots of different ways, um, with different types of businesses and different regions of the, of the world. And so it, it also kind of gives me a platform to like talk about a little bit how different people are doing things, right? Because the, the landscape's changing so fast, especially as you think about like, you know, new technologies like generative AI and other things that are coming into the market. And like, how do you utilize those technologies? And everybody's trying to figure out those things. But as, as we think about your topic, right? Like it is a tough thing, right? Like most CROs come from a background of sales, right? Like, cause that's kind of the, that's the kingpin. And so, uh, you know, typically when you bring a new CRO into an organization, you know, the CS leadership team is going to look at their resume and say, Hey, they've never managed CS. Why do I have to report to this person? And then you might have, um, you know, the head of the SDR team, right? Maybe they're moving from marketing over, they might even be managing all of marketing in some, you know, circumstances. And those functions are like, hey, does this person ever run, you know, these functions of the business? I don't see it on the resume, right? And so, you know, immediately that CRO is being judged, like, how are they going to help, you know, uh, how are they going to help this company? How are they going to help me? How are they going to help my career? And so sometimes that's a really tough place to be for a CRO that comes into a new role. And, you know, I've experienced that in, in my past. And so, you know, I think, um, you know, it's just some advice I could give in, in that area. And uh, if you want to drill down on some of this, these areas, you know, just stop me and we can kind of jump in is, is you really just have to first, I think, and foremost, focus on building relationships with those different functions, right? Like, because if you want, if that CS leader is going to like follow you, they got to trust you and they have to know that you trust them. And so you have to really build trust, especially since they, you may not have the respect and their functional areas that you might have within the sales, you know, side of the house. So I think that's like super key. You have to really just throw yourself into the deep end of learning. How does that company do CS, right? Cause that's a, such a broad term. Every company does it differently, right? Different responsibilities might be on the sales side of the house. They might be on the CS side of the house, right? Like how does that company do it? Why do they do it that way? Why did they make the decisions that they've made in the past? Right. 
um, to, to, to start formulating like any changes you might want to make in the future, right? And so I think that's always key. Like when you come in, understand how the whole from, you know, uh, top of funnel all the way through, you know, client and beyond really happens like in that organization. What's that customer journey look like? And, you know, talking to your clients about like what they like about the experience they've been on with your, you know, your existing, you know, software products. And so <clears throat> if you really spend that time early on, you know, the first kind of 90 days or whatever days you want to put onto it, like it's going to make everything else in the back end, I think a lot better for you. Super. And as the revenue leader, if you treat each group individually, they live in their silos. You have your marketing team always talking about leads and interest. You have your sales team only talking about opportunities and qualified opportunities. And if your customer success team only talking about account and health of the account. And we can't leave them be because the whole idea of revenue function to create one lingo, one mm -hmm. system, one monitoring, one uh, optimization. So, which means you are being asked to force them to change a little bit. How do you handle that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think you have to bring the leadership teams together to bring the teams together, right? And so when I've done it, you know, in the past, I've, I've brought different, you know, groups under one umbrella. And so you had to do that, you know, and it, it hadn't been that way before. And so I think some of the key things to, to really do are, First of all, you can't play favorites. So like if you're a sales background, you can't play favorite to sales, right? And you can't let anybody else think that, you know, you have a favorite because you really shouldn't at this point, right? Because you're managing all functions now equally in your business. Um, you got to bring the leadership teams together of those groups. So it might be like one level down, two levels down, you know, you know, depending on how big the company is, is you know, where you're going to stop. But, you know, do a leadership, you know, get together real early and on your tenure, right? Uh, maybe at two, three months in, kind of set your vision, established with that group, like why it's so important for us to all be on the same page and all act as one team. Um, but I think what you have to really do is you have to set goals and priorities that they all have to contribute the same. And they're all beating towards that same drum and priorities, mm. right? So an example of that would be, you know, pipeline generation. It, it really affects, you know, a lot of aspects of your business, right? And so <clears throat> if you're going to like set pipeline generation goals for each, you know, function, that are all contributing to one number, right? It's like one number that we're trying to go after. We're all going to kind of try to decide, you know, as a team, you know, is marketing responsible for 40, 50%? What's that percentage? You know, like the reps, what are they having to create on an outbound perspective on their own, right? <clears throat> What's your SDRs? What are they trying to generate? Your CS organization from an expansion standpoint, like how many opportunities are they trying to create? Is their compensation all aligned across those different functions? So, if you kind of get the goals and compensation and structure right, right, then it's like we're all driving towards that one number, right? It's not marketing just saying, oh, look how many leads we created, right? And then sales saying, yeah, but these leads are horrible, right? Like we can't do anything with these leads, right? Right. That that doesn't that doesn't happen. And so one way to like make that happen is you have a weekly meeting with the leads of all those people, right? And you invite the CEO sometimes, right? You might even invite product if like you get a lot of leads from, you know, from a PLG motion that you might have alongside an outbound and inbound motion. And so it's like, you, you got to get everybody beating to the same drum, the same goals, the same, you know, uh, key, key metrics versus they all setting their own in a vacuum, right? And then they're all pointing fingers. And so I think if you kind of treat all different projects in that same kind of fashion, it usually, you know, will build like camaraderie. Everybody sees that we're all aligned. We're all one team, right? We're all driving towards one goal. But again, compensation also helps, you know, a lot with that because we all know we're um, you know, if you're in the go-to-market organization, usually you kind of have some bent towards, you know, making money and, and driving revenue. And so you want to like make sure that that's aligned as well. Super. <clears throat> How do you see the role of revenue operations? Uh, RevOps is a growing title. There is all yeah. the talk about RevOps. So how do you see that? I mean, it's like probably the most, you know, key component of all of those things. <laughs> that, that It's the glue that keeps them all together right? It's your, your key insight center, right? It's your, it's, it's your partner for strategy. I mean, like, I think that the revenue leadership role is one of the most important roles, like in any go-to-market function, especially in that, that structure, right? Especially, you know, if you have that person reporting into the C, the CRO, which I like, I think some organizational will have it reporting up to the COO, some will have it reporting to the CFO. I mean, there's kind of differing opinions on that. 
but like, you know, the bigger the company gets, the more talented and seasoned person I think that is, is ideal to have in that seat. And I think that's why you're seeing compensation go through the roof over the last five years for that, for that person, because it's such a unique skill set, right? Like I've hired a number of people in that, in that function and, and, and executives in that role. And I mean, I'm actually trying to do it now for one of my customers. And it's like this unique skill set of like, ideally they have had to carry a bag at some point, right? Like, so they really understand sales because what does sales or CS hate is some, you know, rev ops leader that knows nothing about their function telling them what to do if they've never really experienced it. And so like, they, they, ideally they maybe started in CS or started in sales or at least did BDR, did something in that arena. So they, they really get the, the language and understand the challenges, right? And then you want to be almost like an engineer, you know, almost like a computer scientist, like, cause they're like a lot of times hands-on tech, like you're, you're maybe having to implement a new sales force and they're having to like oversee the consultants for all that, right? You're implementing new technology that's, that's hot and coming out, right? Hopefully you're implementing boost up at some point, right? So there, there, there's all these things that they have to do. They're leading teams. They're helping you with territory design and analyzing your marketing spend. I mean, there's just, it's, it's just a lot of hats that that person has to wear. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they kind of have to be a jack of all trades and good at all those different things. And ideally like deep in maybe one of them. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, again, it's just, it's just one of the most key roles at, at this point because, in, in my opinion, really because of the rise of technology and how we sell. Hmm. Like when I started off at IBM, I think it was 2000, they gave me a yellow pages, right? And this was selling to enterprise clients uh, in a big city, Dallas, Fort Worth, right? It was like, here's the yellow pages, you know, here's your accounts, go sell $500,000, you know, piece starting point servers, right? Like, Really, like, I mean, that's all I had. And I mean, if you think about now, I mean, like some of these, you know, $100 million SaaS companies will have, you know, 40 or 50 tools in their marketing stack. Right. And so, you know, it's not just the yellow pages anymore. And so you got to have someone that can, can do all those things and then pull the data and the insights out of all those things and make sense of it, right? Because I think a lot of companies just spend oodles of money on tech. It's not all tied together. They're not all like, you know, pieced in, in the right way together, getting the value that you should be getting out of them. And so I think, you know, as I think about kind of the future of that space, there's a lot of consolidation going on right now. Mm -hmm. I think that will happen. I mean, a lot of companies aren't going to get funding, you know, over the next few years, as we all know. And so you're going to see more and more consolidation. But I think the winners are going to be ones that can do a lot of those things, or the winners are going to be the companies that can tie all that together and make sense of it for the, for the leadership, you know, teams. Because, you know, if you got to go into outreach and you got to go into boost up and you got to go into HubSpot and you got to go into, you know, all your different products like that. Now they're all siloed, right? And it's just like, you know, you're trying to break up those silos in your organization. You're trying to break up those silos in your tech stacks. And so, you know, I think that's where the industry is really going. Makes sense. Um, so this is great discussion so far about all the various challenges that uh, a new CRO will have to face. Mm -hmm. There is also a seriality to uh, what happens first and then next. So as a new CRO comes in, obviously, the revenue pressure is always one of the predominant things that will drive. What are your advices? What should the first quarter be about? Mm -hmm. What should the second quarter be about? How should they look at their, let's call it a two-year tenure? Yeah, I think if you really want to set up you know, your CRO for success in the new role is you got to give them a little time and space, right? If you think about the NFL as an example, like most college quarterbacks coming right out of college, they're not successful day one, right? And they're not going to be thrown on the starting field day one, right? Mm -hmm. Most of the quarterbacks that have been successful. They, they get a year or two maybe of learning, you know, and then they, they come in. Now you don't have a year or two <laughs> in SAS, but ideally if you have a couple months at least, where you're not just, they come in day one, here's all your people, here's all your problems, go make all these hires, fix all these things, right? Like, they're gonna be like, oh my goodness. And so, you know, if you can give that individual some time and space, right, where maybe like the, the existing reporting structure might stay in place for a couple months and let that, you know, that new CRO just kind of like, you know, walk the halls, be on the calls, like, end all the meetings, ask all the questions, like formulate, all the problem statements, figure out what some of those suggestions are, what your, your ask might be, what budget you might need to do. Like, 
like let that person really, you know, spend time on some strategy before they're like day-to-day operating. Because once you're day-to-day operating, like the strategy becomes really, really hard. Um, and that's what I always struggled myself with was like balancing my schedule. Cause you're like booked nonstop, right? Like when do you have time to really strategically think for me, it was always on airplanes. I would not buy the Wi-Fi, and that way I could like really just sit down and strategically think about the challenges in my business and, and build, build some like content for those challenges. Um, and so, you know, I think that that's really key, right. Is not coming in guns a blazing, make all these changes, but like really use that time and space. Now, some CRs aren't going to have that. Like things are going to be on fire. They've been waiting for this person for three extra months and they would have liked to have them, you know, back in January. Now it's starting, you know, June. And so it's just not the reality, but you still have to carve out time for, for strategy. And so I think that time and space is important. Building relationships is important, not just within the go-to-market function, but like your, your, you know, your CEO's team is just as important as your team, right? Mm-hmm. And I think some sellers are probably so selfish and they tend to stay selfish all the way up into leadership roles that they, they take that with them up into the leadership capacity. And they're not thinking like company, they're thinking me, my team, how do we become successful? How do we make the most money? Which is important, but like you have to really keep in mind that the leadership team that you report to is, you know, is just as important again as your team. And so building relationships with those individuals, team you inherited, breaking bread with those people in a virtual world today, that's so much harder. So you can't just go to a headquarters where everybody's going to be, right? So you have to be really purposeful about going to visit people. I think early on, you know, go jump on a plane, go to London, go to, you know, India, wherever you got to go to meet your, your team in, in this day and age and get to know those people. Cause it's going to, it's just going to make everything else better. So once you've built that trust, right? Like you're going to be able to do that. And then like you, you've, you've kind of set yourself up for success, right? You kind of have a strategic plan. You've got your relationships in place. Then you're going to prioritize all those things. Get the, the rest of the executives on board with all the changes, you know, that you want to make. And um, hopefully you've got some funding allocated for those things, right? And, and once you've got that trust built, then you can go attack all those different things. And so, you know, I think that's kind of just, I didn't really script this, this conversation out, you know, not knowing what our questions would be, obviously, but just like kind of off the top of my head, like that's kind of like probably the plan of attack I would, I would advise. Yeah, natural flow is one of the best flow. I love uh, to get your take. Maybe we can end with this uh, final thought on you have, and this might be a little bit of a plug as well. You've used Boost Up. Uh, you have used other technology. You have been one of such innovative leaders who paid attention to right tools and systems, empowers people to do their job better. So now having years of experience in looking at the tool stack in the revenue operations level, what did you like about Boost Up uh, and what stood out for you? Yeah, I mean, I've I've used your one of your big competitors um, many, multiple times, I think three or four times in my career. Um, and, you know, I think what really led us to boost up in the first place was they just failed for many, many months to, 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 to make the changes that we needed. There was bugs, the forecasting wasn't working. And uh, a lot of that went, went back to, we changed our fiscal year, at least the blame that they, you know, uh, associated with, which I was like, a lot of people change their fiscal year. This can't be that hard. And so it just, it, I mean, it, 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 you have to be highly frustrated, right, to go out and like to the market and look for for another solution to, to implement. And, you know, that's what how we kind of stumbled upon Boost Up. And what I loved was, was you know, that it was, it was nice. That it was a fresh start for us. But um, you guys are pretty early when we came, uh, you know, uh, to you. I don't think I knew quite how small you were at the time, you know, but your tech team was phenomenal. And like, your product was was like far advanced than anything I could imagine for a company that size. And it was more advanced than your big competitors. And you were able to make changes like, like literally the week that we would ask you. Like I was just bragging about your company to a, to a colleague uh, just this past week. Cause I said, we would come to Boost Up and they, we would say, this thing needs to be tweaked. Can you move this thing here? Can you change your way you do roll-ups? And, and you guys would literally do it in a week. It was wild. Wow. It would work. It wasn't buggy. And so like when a, when a, when a company does that and like shows that type of partnership for you, right? Like it, it really endears you to them. Right. And so I, I just, for me, it was really just like the execution and the speed to execution uh, that boost up, you know, kind of showed. Um, 
you know, when I left that company and went to my next role, I was like, oh no, you just implemented the competitor. Like you just did it. Like I can't, but I can't rip it out. Uh, because we've already paid for it. Um, there are many, many people from degree who left. And I think there are five or six who then in the first week and first month said, I want boost up. So I have big thank you for you. And I'm very passionate about the product that you have, not only because of the functionality that it provides in the business that I'm in of like trying to forecast revenue, but just the, the way that we worked with uh, boost up when I was at degree, when you guys were fairly early on, I don't know how many employees you had probably in the 20 ish range, you know, back in that time, but I would have thought you might've had 150. Like I had no clue, you know, how small you were um, because the tech was so solid and the innovation cycles were so fast. It just, it really like shocked all of us. You know, I remember having conversations on our, on our side of the, uh, of the fence where I'd ask, you know, my revenue ops leader, Hey, can you ask boost up to do X, Y, Z? And he'd be like, yeah, I can ask them, but we'll see. They, they're probably not going to be able to do this thing. And then like the next week it was in the product. Right. And, and it wasn't just there in some like sandbox. It was there working in our live environment. And, and, you know, hopefully we were able to at least help a little bit in, in some of the, the early designs and changes that you guys made. But just the team behind that, you know, thank you for all the work that you guys, you know, put into that. Because I'm sure pulling off some of that stuff behind the scenes was not easy, right? Um, you know, maybe there were some people that are up late all night trying to pull off some of those, you know, product enhancements for us. But, you know, it's it's awesome to hear that, um, you know, some of the the people that worked for me or are with me at uh, Degree have now implemented, you know, the product as well. Uh, and I think that's a testament, right? Like you made huge fans of, of, of us uh, when we were in that hyper growth phase and um you know that, well, that's you know paying playing dividends for you so yeah absolutely it is and uh, we are thankful for you trusting us uh you're right at the time in 2020 we were maybe 25 employees at the time maybe projected like 100 because who wants to say we are very small the rock <laughs> bed of boost up has been its people and their um hunger for making it possible the advantage we had was we were building this technology in the 2020s where product can be built faster, um, technology had matured. And also the advantage we had, we all had this chip on the shoulder to prove it to the world that we can do it better, faster, and cheaper. So PJ, I want to thank you for the podcast recording. Thanks.